Structural engineering, it's an art form. Now you may not think about it with the modern day structural engineers you see out there. They're just doing some numbers, looking at FEA and making structures work. When you look back in the past, you see the true art form that it can be. This is through the many amazing churches and stuff throughout Italy, Spain and Europe. The people that created them were not only architects, they were also engineers to create these magnificent masterpieces. You can see this most commonly in areas like the Cathedral di Florence in Italy or the Sacra Familia in Barcelona. They had to come up with unique ways not only to construct them, how they go together and where the forces go to make these impressive structures. And especially when you look at a tower such as Gaudi, you can see this through the string lines that he had to use to work out the low pass to make such an amazing structure work. It actually took a long time after he actually designed it that we could actually analyze it effectively to show that it was structurally stable. But unfortunately, this art form is being overlooked not only just by the wider community where they recognize architects as the artisans and praise for the amazing structures they build, but also by the engineering community, which don't really see us as an art form, but something in the background where we just do numbers and make things work. So now let's bring the art form back through some basic principles so that you can come up with these magnificent structures and save money. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. When most people start designing buildings, they start at the bottom and transfer the loads up. So they start off with a solid base, building up your structure, making a structure that is extremely stable as it's built on a solid foundation. As we build up this building, you can see a couple of things. We have our solid base, our solid foundations. But when I press down, it is stable, it doesn't move. But let's make a slight change. Let's use a soft system that you can see that flexes under the load that it sees. Now, if we put that same structure up, put it on top, but press down, we can see that we have an unstable system where the structure slipped off. So this is one of the first principles that you should be looking at, is making sure that your foundations are founded on a similar material. Because if they're not, you'll have weird transfers of load through your structure where load may spread to one area that is undesirable for your system. So making sure that you're founding on a solid base that's of a similar stiffness. So you get a more stable and a more regular structure so you know how it's going to behave. Now, you know what you're thinking. Surely we can have some mixed foundations. It doesn't matter if we get a little bit of settlement. But we can see some major failures such as Mascot Tower which seemingly had a foundation issue causing major effects of the structure that actually needed to be evacuated and it's in a current state of potentially getting demolished just because it wasn't founded on the right material. So you can see these mistakes do get made and potentially you need to look out for how they actually came about and making sure that your structure is founded on solid material. It will lead to a structure that is more blocky but is more stable but it's not nearly as elegant and free floating as some structures that you may see out there today. So how do they manage to do this? They know the basic principles of stresses in buildings and where forces flow, how they actually behave, making sure they're using elements in the correct location. You get out that FEA software and start playing with it and seeing how loads actually transfer through your building. And something you'll realize quite quickly when doing this is that load always wants to travel to the stiffest path first until that path becomes slightly softer, either through cracking or movements of load. So you'll see compression struts getting formed. You've see tension ties getting formed. Now, even if you've got a big wall, you can't just guess any way the load is gonna transfer. It's gonna to go to the stiffest path, typically floating at about a 45 degree angle, forming tension ties. Only time these tension ties or these struts can get steeper is if that tension tie starts to crack, making that path softer. So the load will go into a steeper angle but because you've softened the load path, allowing systems to crack and soften up, allowing the path to go down a different direction. Is this unsafe? No, provided you've designed it correctly, but it's about knowing how and how much you can do and how much cracking you actually need to achieve to redistribute the loads there. Knowing how and which structures can crack and redistribute these loads, it's about knowing how the material behaves. So if you've got something like a block, or even better, a stick, you can see that it can apply a lot of compression force. We can have a lot of compression force. We can have a little bit of tension force, but we can easily crack it by just bending it. With just a little bit of force, with a couple of fingers, we can crack this system. So this is similar to concrete. Concrete is really good under compression, but really bad under tension. I'm just using flexural tension here to demonstrate this, but it's kind, it's similar in purpose where you go crack, but now, how about something like a cable? Now we use cables all the time in concrete design because they're really good under tension. We have the same thing. We try and bend it. 
We try and pull it, it's really good under tension. You bend it, you can turn it into shapes. It doesn't actually crack, but if you try and push compression force on it, it can collapse. So knowing which materials we need to put where. So anytime we have a tension zone, is trying to reinforce it with steel and removing as much concrete as possible because that concrete is just gonna crack and be in the way, leading to an inefficient design. Now, when your struts do form, there will be some secondary actions that you will need to reinforce for it, meaning there will be a load divergence. That divergence causes a tension action, which if you reinforce for, you'll have a lot stiffer, stronger structure. But then in areas where you're just getting pure tension ties, because at the bottom of those struts, is where you need to provide your steel, because it provides that great tension capacity that gives you the strength that you need in those locations. But with any good principle, they can always be broken underneath the right circumstances. But it's about knowing how materials behave and how they best react. Now, much like this cable, it's not very good underneath a compression force, but the arch that it forms would be the same if you inverse it. So if you had a compression material only and inverse this arch, you would have a very stable structure, much like this string. So this is where you can use simple principles such as string to know how the load is gonna flow through your building to create those more efficient systems. So if you have the ability, you can create these amazing shell structures Another amazing thing is if you add separate little weights to this system, you'll see it flow different arches. So if you have a big net with different loads on top of it, you'll see it forming a net force of how the loads actually transfer. Those loads could be additional compression forces such as towers or other elements. So you can form this compression shell structure with different loads on it and how the loads flow through. You don't need that fancy FEA. All you'll need is a little bit of string in knowing that same principle. Now something you may be noticing about some of these rule sets, I haven't talked about code, I haven't talked about how you actually assess things. I've just talked about some of the basic principles that you need to know about structural mechanics. All of these systems is all about understanding your risk and where you can actually risk things or whether you need to apply additional redundancy. This is where structural engineers really get into their own and something is quite often overlooked as we try to be quite conservative. But some areas we know we can push the boundaries a little bit because if that fails, what's the end of the world? Now this happens quite a lot in earthquake design where you allow certain elements to fail in your structure, which is kind of counterintuitive makes your structure softer. But if that structure fails and doesn't cause an amazing catastrophic event, is it really the end of the world? Because the structure still survives. So sometimes you may need to blow some fuses, allow your structure to break in some areas. Because you've just seen a major earthquake on that system, meaning that we'll need to have some repairs done. But those repairs aren't that bad because it's not a life safety issue. It's something that you come, can come back later to repair and make more efficient. This is very similar to live loads and loads that you apply to your structure. There's been a lot of studies back in the past and something that we probably need to redo now. It's a lot of the live loads that we assign are not really appropriate for today's structures. Because if you look back in the office back in the past, there was papers piled up everywhere. But when you go into a modern day office, you can't see any of that. So the live load on an office building is a lot less than what it used to be. And everything with engineering is about understanding that risk. Because we have different bell curves. We have a bell curve for, for material strength and we have a bell curve for loading. Where typically we're on the lower end of the bell curve for the strength. So it means that 90% of the time our structure is stronger than that. Where for the loading it's the opposite. Where we're saying 90% of the time our structure is lighter than that. And there's a crossover point here which is about 1 in 100,000 or 1 in a million depending on how much safety you've put into a design, where everyone could have done everything properly. You designed the structure with the right material. You designed it for the right load. You built it correctly, but that structure still failed because it just happened to meet both a weak system and an overload system that it couldn't do at the same time. Now, people may not be thinking about that, they may be thinking their houses are rocks, but if we were designed for every single situation, our structure would be completely over-designed and costing you a lot more money. And you think about the environmental effect that that would have. This is something that moving forward that engineers, we need to bring into our arsenal, into our art form is about understanding in the environmental science and how we can actually change our designs and substitute different materials with different things and changing how we actually design buildings. You may not know the sustainable impact of a building is mostly in the concrete where about 10% of the global emissions is done from concrete alone. So think about that. If you can reduce concrete by 10%, 50%, that's a 10 to 50% reduction in the embodied carbon in your building just by you being more efficient and not over designing certain systems that don't need to be. But if you wanna know one fact that you probably don't know about structural engineering, that would bring your designs to the next level. I've got a link to a video here. 
and you'd be interested in supporting the channel, there's two ways that you can do this. And you can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, the content would not be of the quality it is today. I hope to see you next week and keep learning. Bye.